the webinar. The first of all that certainly you have already recognized is that you are all muted. That means uh, that uh, of course uh, no sound is going to come from um, your uh, computer uh, however that does not mean that you cannot ask for questions you're actually very welcome to do so <clears throat> I will gather all the questions that I receive and that we receive either in the question part of your screen in the right hand side bottom side of your screen or in the chat question of your screen and I uh, will then create a Word document that we can read together and um, together with our expert give an answer to the question at the end uh, of the webinar. This way we're going to secure the flow of the information and most importantly we're not going to disturb our expert with background noises which are uh, very very unpleasant especially if we are connected through a technology medium like uh, GoToWebinar today. Said that, the first question that we always receive is when will we receive today's slide and the recording of the webinar? You are going to receive them as soon as possible, either ideally this afternoon or tomorrow morning. Um, and there's going to be a PDF slide of uh, our experts' um, presentation and of the services of uh, the European IP Health Desk that I'm going to show you in a minute. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, yes, so uh, additionally, uh, we are going to send you also a couple of uh, useful documents together with our um, slides and uh, recording within the follow up email. At, as I said, you will receive in uh, the next uh, 24 48 uh, hours. Um, today, we have for the first time, and it is a pleasure uh, to host uh, this webinar because I think it is very interesting and very specific uh, as well to talk about the technical examination within uh, the Community Plant Variety Rights uh, Office, so the DUS uh, test, uh, which uh, is for distinctiveness, uniformity and stability characteristic of, uh, folk of uh, seed uh, propagated species. For doing this today, we have a uh, examiner from the uh, European uh, Plant Variety Rights Office, uh, who is uh, Dr. Anne Weitz. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us uh, today, uh, Anne. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to still use a couple of minutes more uh, for the services of the European IP Health Desk. So, before we start, I'd like to remind uh, to those of you um, who are perhaps for the first time with us uh, what, who we are and what we do as European IP Health Desk. We are a service initiative of the European Commission that can offer you the following services that you can see here on the right hand side of the screen. We organize trainings which are on site and online like uh, today. And I'm going to give you a list of webinars that you can check out until the end of the year that perhaps can be interesting for you. You can register to those webinars and to those online on, and on-site events through our website. The website is the uh, center access point for all of our services, shall they be trainings or uh, documents, publications, templates that you can find online or also to get in touch with our ambassadors that might be the nearest uh, contact point to the European IP help desk within the territory of your country. Then uh, finally but probably most importantly we have a helpline service which is a uh, pool of experts sitting in Alicante that are waiting there for your questions and are going to answer you within three working days in the most understandable way possible and um, all of the services are free of charge so i would suggest you at least to give it a try and see uh, how we work this is for your information the upcoming list of webinar actually some of them have uh, 
have already uh, been carried out. But if you click on the link when I will send you the PDF slide, you have the chance to uh, land directly on the website page and register yourself for the webinar. Registration are open from three weeks in advance uh, and uh, until the very day of the webinar. So you're very welcome to join us if you have a little bit of time and, of course, interest in the topic that is going to be analyzed. Finally, if your um, activities are outside Europe uh, and you're interested in how intellectual property works uh, in other countries that are not part of the European Union, we have brothers and sisters out there that can help you and provide you with the same services that we have, but for countries that are outside the European Union. So if you want to know, for example, how a patent works in Brazil or in Southeast Asia, um, you can ask to those help desks uh, there. Also, a new initiative of the European Commission, uh, Cousins, I would say, is the IP BUSA that can help by uh, entering into, into the market and uh, uh, creating uh, a leverage value for intellectual property that you create within, for example, university or uh, public uh, centers as well. With that, I am uh, not going to um, harass you with further administrative uh, information, and I would <laughs> then give um, the word uh, to our expert, uh, which I thank once again for uh, being uh, here. Uh, and uh, I can see your presentation, and I'm sure also the participants can. Uh, I would, Anne, perhaps only put it a little bit broader, so, like, uh, so that we can see it full screen. Great. Now I'm going to mute myself and not disturb. Okay, can we start? Good morning, my name is Anne Weitz. I'm working at the CPBO as technical expert for agricultural crops, but generally for seed crops. Uh, I would like to thank the IP help desk for this opportunity to give the webinar and particularly uh, Michele Dubini for his kind assistance during the setup of this part. We will have a number of slides to go through and uh, you will see that uh, the presentation is divided into two parts. The first one is a more general part where you have a introduction to the whole system and uh, the second one is a, spe a specific part where you see the particular part of um, the seed propagated species. I try to see everything on my screen as well. Okay, I have a picture here, a window, which does disturb me a little bit. Uh, I hope I will get this uh, a bit up. Can you see the whole slides? I, get, I hope so. Okay, so let's continue. We have the general part, which will talk about the EU PDP system, then the filing of applications, the technical examination, which is in fact the DUS test, to explain a little bit where and how this will take place, a little word on the reporting and the relation between the CPVO and the examination office. And then we come on the part one, the focus on seed propagated species. And tomorrow my colleague Jens Wegner will give a presentation uh, in relation to a focus on vegetatively propagated species. In that part one, we will go uh, to the technical protocols, which are the basis. We will look at the DUS characteristics, particularly on uniformity, stability and distinctness, which will end up in a DUS report, the variety description and a hint to some uh, variety databases. So let's start with the first part. The EU PVP system is a sui generis system for the inter industrial property right of plant variety rights. And these intellectual property rights are granted under this system and valid throughout the 28 member states of the EU, which are today covering some 500 million consumers. The system was established by a council regulation, and uh, this happened in, two, in 1994. 
and it is modeled on the International Convention for the Protection of New Varieties of Plants, shortly called UPOF, on the convention in 1991. The European Union became party to the UPOF as intergovernmental organization in 2005. The specificity under this convention 1991 is that you have varieties of all botanical genera and species which may be protected. Until today, we have received at the CPVO applications in relation to more than 2,200 different plant species. And today we have more than 28,000 uh, titles in force. The CPVO is managing this system and putting it into practice. We are located in Angers in France. We are an official agency of the EU and we are operational since 1995. That means uh, we will soon have our 25th anniversary. We have an independent legal status and we are fully self-financed by fees from the applicants, which means we are independent from the EU budget. Some uh, main features of the EU PVP system is the basis is the Council regulation dating from 1994. And then we have some implementing rules of the European Commission, which are in the first place the proceedings before the CPVO, the fees payable to the CPVO and the agricultural exemption, which is in relation to the farm safe seat. Uh, the most important feature of this EU PVP system is that with one application, you have uh, one procedure, one technical examination, and one decision, which ideally leads to a grant of a protection in the 28 member states of the EU. The conditions to be fulfilled to, uh, to obtain a community plant variety right are a variety must be distinct, uniform and stable, that's shortly DUS. These are the technical conditions. And then we have some legal requirements, which are novelty. The variety must not have been commercialized longer than one year within the EU and not longer than four years outside the EU. And it must have, of course, a variety denomination. The protection period is then 25 years for the big majority of all applications and 30 years for wine and trees. There are also 30 years for potatoes, but that is a special regime in which I do not want to go into detail at the occasion of this uh, seminar. Now coming to the filing of applications. You can go on the website of uh, the CPVO and you see the link on which you click and then you come to the possibility to file applications. There are two possibilities. You either file online or you file on paper. Uh, today, the office receives uh, close to 100% of the applications online. Uh, one reason is probably that uh, the application fee is reduced to 450 euros in comparison to the application fee if you submit the application on paper, where it is 650 euros. And that will increase uh, next year to 850 euros as from 1st of April. Uh, we have also, and I think that is very useful for applicants and procedural representatives, a help center on that page where you have replies to frequently asked questions. And in addition, below all screens, you have a little box where it is mentioned contact as if ever you struggle with particular uh, questions or if you need some more explanations. So the filing of the applications goes, uh, I'm only concentrating today on the online applications with a tool which is established called MyPVR. It is uh, serving for e-applications and e-communications for the online application system. It provides for a secured web pages and has gives you access to files related to information you need for the processing of your application. And in this light, it is a communication channel between the applicants and the CPVO. Now, we are still in the chapter filing of applications. That means you submit your application. And if everything is in good order, 
you will receive an application date. The application date is a very important date because it uh, gives a legal existence to your application and it is also used to, at that moment, determine the novelty requirement, the common knowledge status and uh, the priority in relation to other candidate varieties. The date a valid application is received by a CPVO and the fees are paid within the time limit will be the application date. Then you receive what we call an R form, which R means reception form with the application date. If you receive an R form observation, that means there is something missing on the application, but you got a pending application date. And if you remedy to the missing part, that original application date when you submitted the application could be maintained. The third case is you will receive a no form, which means the application is not valid and the no stands we cannot attribute an application date. The status is then not filed and you will have one month following the no form in order to remedy to the, the missing information. If the fees remain unpaid, that are the application fees, then the application date will be removed and the status will become not filed after one month following the reminder. And normally you are invited to pay the application fee together with the submission of the uh, application. If there is no application date, there is no publication in the official gazette of the CPVO and then you also cannot go for an appeal. When we receive the documents uh, of the application, we will do the examination of those documents and I only mention here the technical aspects. We need to identify the botanical taxon. Often this is not an issue, but for some uh, species that can be rather complicated, particularly if we enter into uh, interspecific hybrids or uh, subspecific hybrids. Then we see if you have made earlier applications of your variety or if a technical examination took uh, place elsewhere already for the possibility to maybe take over the DUS report which exists already. I will come to this at the later stage. We look also at the geographical origi origin, the breeding history, so the parents of varieties, the technical description you provided in the technical questionnaire, Photos are only requested for fruit ornamentals. And we also ask you in the technical questionnaire, shortly TQ, uh, what are the similar varieties to your candidate variety and if there are special conditions for the growing of the variety. Here in this slide, I will not uh, in detail go through to this slide. You have an overview of the processing of applications your applications arrives at the CPVO in what we call the register, the registry. Then it goes to the case holder, which is the technical expert of the CPVO, where we check all the technical information we need to have and whether all these conditions are fulfilled. The case holder then enters into communication with the National Examination Office and uh, at the same time, normally, together with an application, you have submitted a variety denomination proposal that will be assessed by the denomination assistant. And then uh, the technical examination of the variety starts or we take already over a report. It goes back to the case holder who will prepare then a decision for the committee who takes the final decision whether the application can be granted or refused. Filing of application of course implies fees and here you have an overview of the current uh, fees schedule. We have uh, divided the different types of species which are grown uh, under certain regimes into fee groups we have it from 1 to 14, the agricultural crops, the first four, and you see what type of uh, group uh, represents a certain type of testing. And there you have the fees an applicant has to pay per growing period to the CPVO. Uh, for the fruit, we have three groups. 
And for the ornamentals, we have uh, five groups. And then we have for the vegetables, two groups, which are essentially greenhouse tests or outdoor tests. Coming to the technical examination. Uh, the basis for the technical examination is laid down in the basic regulation in Article 55. And there it is stated that the office shall arrange for the test and the examination relating to the compliance, which are laid down in Articles 7, 8 and 9, which is distinctness, uniformity and stability. And that test needs to be carried out by a competent office. These are the examination offices in a member state of the European Union, which is entrusted for that technical examination for that species by the Administrative Council. Then Article 56 is about the conduct of the technical examination and there you essentially have to retain that the varieties have to be grown. There is no paper assessment. Every variety will be put in the field or in the glasshouse and assessed and that such conduct of a technical examination is to be carried out in accordance with the test guidelines issued by the Administrative Council. That is what we call the technical protocols. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, we also have the possibility to take over a DUS report. A DUS report contains a statement on the fact if the variety is distinct, uniform and stable. You remember the technical requirement for a grant <coughs> and in addition as well a variety description. And uh, in Article 27 of the Proceedings Regulation it is foreseen that an examination report on the results of a technical examination which has been carried out already or is in the process of being carried out for official purposes may be considered by the office to, go, to make a sufficient basis for a decision and then there are certain conditions. That means if you have filed earlier an application into an official authority, let's say for national listing, I'll come to this later, or for a national plant variety right, and that office is entrusted for the species, the CPVO can take over the DUS report as a basis for a decision if the test has been carried out according to the CPVO rules, which is mostly the case in the member states of the European Union. And in that takeover fee, uh, you have to pay 320 euros instead of the examination fee, which makes uh, quite a difference. This possibility of taking over the US reports exists uh, since a long time between members of uh, UPOLF. Uh, we also in Europe have discussed to enforce this, this principle. We call it a one key several doors principle and it means that where the US test has already been carried out, as mentioned earlier, for an official register, such US examination should not be carried out a second time. That saves, saves uh, time and money. And this is often related to prior applications for national listing for the authorization of the commercialization of varieties within the EU. Uh, such obligation to be listed in the so-called common catalogue before commercialization relates to important agricultural and vegetable species, which are mentioned in the so-called uh, seed directive uh, of the European Union. I have put here under a link where you can get uh, the information in relation to listing in the EU. Then I uh, would like to show you on this slide the CPVO network of examination offices in the EU. Uh, that means that the CPVO itself has not set up own examination offices. It relies on the network of already existing uh, examination offices in the member states. You have, for example, here in France, we work with uh, Geves, uh, in the Netherlands with Nachteinbau, uh, in Italy with Crea, uh, in Denmark with Tistofte, and so on and so on. Coming back to the DUS test, uh, you may want to know where will my variety be tested? Uh, we have on our website an S3 publication, which shows the entrusted examination offices by species. 
S3 stands for Special Gazette. The office has to publish applications, grants, and other information in the S1. Then we have the S2, to which I come later, which is also a special gazette, and the S3 is the special gazette on the entrustment of uh, examination offices for species. And here you can search for the species you're interested in, also the country, but you do not need to fill in that. And then you have here, I just uh, put a little printout, you can also export it to, to Excel, the species name, uh, which is uh, concerned, the fee group, I showed you earlier the table, uh, the number of growing cycles, the country, and uh, what is the name of uh, this authority. So that is in order to know where will my variety be tested or what are the different countries who offer a testing of this species. For us at the CPBO, we have uh, for the organization of the technical examination of your candidate variety criteria to respect. And that is uh, the wish of the breeder. You can indicate this in the technical questionnaire. The geographical origin of the variety uh, and uh, the origin of the applicant and the experience of an examination office. That means uh, some are more experienced than others and we try to group to keep experience also located. Still, where do, does the DOS test take place? Uh, the ones uh, we have chosen the examination office, uh, you can also get the information on which type of material and which quantities and qualities you need to submit for your variety. This is very useful to get information before you file an application. This information is also on our website and that is the S publication. Special Gazette on the submission of plant material. Uh, it tells you what you have to be prepared to uh, submit plant material to an examination office for the DOS test. I took here as an example barley and uh, you can see it's probably very small but you will better see it on the printout. Uh, uh, just uh, selection, there are further examination offices further down for this species, then uh, for the spring type, the fee group for seeing growing cycles, that is Estonia, and uh, that is the closing date, which means if you submit an application by this date, uh, we will be able to integrate your candidate variety in the next upcoming growing season. Then the submission end date, that means by that date, you should have at the latest submitted plant material. And in the last column, what are the requirements you are expected to have? Uh, for seeds, it's not such a problem. It can really be a problem for uh, uh, plant material, which you may need to introduce into the EU with all phytosanitary conditions. So please check the S2 before so that you can be sure that you have the material available when you submit the application. How is the DOS test carried out? The basis is the technical uh, tech protocols of the CPVO. Mostly these are CPVO protocols. If there are no CPVO protocols because it's, for example, a small species, then we use the UPOF technical guideline, and if it is even smaller, then often there are national protocols at the national examination offices. You can find this under this link here. Uh, we have, of course, uh, to talk to each other so that you know what you are expected to do. Uh, I mentioned earlier the S2. Uh, please look at this, and you will receive at a certain moment. Uh, the request from the CPVO to submit the material. Please do not do this on your own initiative. Uh, there is information on the material required and including the deadlines. And once the examination has started, or the, the excuse me, <coughs> the material request has been sent, during this procedure, you will also be arrived if there were any problems. Maybe we could extend the submission period. Um, so you better contact the office if you face problems. You will also get a feedback if there were problems with the quality delivered or any problem uh, uh, told by the examination office to the CPVO will be communicated to you. 
Once the test has started as a general principle, if you have only one growing cycle, normally after that growing cycle, you should receive a DOS report together with the variety description if the result is positive. But if we have more than one growing cycle, you receive after each growing cycle an interim report uh, where you can see what the result of this uh, growing cycle was. If during the technical examination, because the interim report, you receive it at the end of uh, one growing cycle, but during the examination, let's say in uh, July in the maize testing, there is a problem, you will receive uh, an invitation to see the trial and you will receive an information on the problem. So as I said earlier, the final report will be sent to you then. Uh, you have uh, the possibility to comment. And if everything goes well, you will uh, receive uh, subsequently to it a grant with a certificate from the office on your community plan right. right. Here is just a slide uh, which you can study later and the relation between the CPVO and the applicants and the examination officers <clears throat> and what it implies on both sides. And here again, here is a summary on uh, the relation between the CPVO and the examination office. Now coming to the second part, which is going to get technical focus on seed propagated species. Um, uh, it is not so easy to make a presentation where you have advanced and less advanced uh, participants. So I tried to explain the principles. You might be astonished a little bit on the order of how it is presented. And in addition to this, uh, uh, everything is to a certain extent uh, related. So uh, you will also have the opportunity to look into this uh, with more time when you will have the PDF in front of you. So here we focus on seed propagated species. Um, and in that uh, second part, or part one, uh, since there will be another seminar tomorrow, we will talk about technical protocols, the characteristics on uniformity, stability and distinctness. You see it is USD, the DUS report, variety descriptions and variety databases. Um, you might wonder why we did uh, separate uh, species, seed species from vegetatively propagated species. And here is in a table an overview. It is very general, but to, to make you understand why uh, that triggers uh, different uh, actions. We have on one hand the seed and on the other hand, let's say the cuttings, that's shorter. And the testing facility for seeds, it's mostly outdoor and for vegetative, it's indoor. The environment is not controlled. Uh, we make this with replications, as you know, but in the greenhouse we have a rather controlled environment. The number of growing cycles for seeds is mostly two, that is due to the environmental impact. And for vegetatively propagated is mostly one, ornamentals mostly in the greenhouse. Uh, fruits can grow up to four growing cycles, but that is an exception, apples for example. The reference collection, which is composed of those varieties to which the candidate variety needs to be compared in order to establish that it is really distinct to all existing varieties of common knowledge already, is for the seeds propagated species what we call a living reference collection. That means the examination offices do have code chambers in which they keep seed bags of these varieties, whereas for ornamentals. Uh, this is a non-living variety collection. Uh, they get the application of the candidate varieties and they identify potentially similar varieties and order them at the same time as the material for the candidate variety. The genetic heterogeneity of the varieties which are seed propagated is little for self-pollinators to very important. Let's uh, think about cross-pollinators or even populations. Whereas in uh, vegetatively, it's rather little, it's more or less clones. The method of observation of the characteristics is in seed essentially measurements, but also visual observations, wherein vegetatively it's essentially visual. And that implies uh, that the data analysis for uh, seeds is mostly statistics, not only, but mostly, and in vegetatively, it's mostly notes. 
However, the principle of the DOS test remain the same. As I said earlier, the bases are the technical protocols. Here is an extract of the Bali protocol. It is adopted at a certain date by the Administrative Council and it has also an entry into force date. Here is just an extract of the table of content and uh, we have a method of examination and uh, particularly chapter four where we talk about the assessment of DUS, the grouping of varieties is chapter six and again uh, very uh, important is chapter seven the table of characteristics. Here is an extract of the table of characteristics for Bali. You see the numbering according to the, UPO, to the CPVO protocol. Uh, the CPVO protocol is mostly based on the UPOF protocol, therefore the numbering here. Here we describe the stage at which that uh, characteristic must be observed together with the method. I will come to this later. The characteristic itself with its expressions and then example varieties here in Bali, we are in a situation where we have spring type varieties and winter type varieties. And then at the end, the node you attribute to each observation. The characteristics observed must, and here we come to what has been defined on UPOF level, result from a given genotype, be consistent and repeatable. There must be variation between varieties they must be precisely defined and recognizable. They must allow uniformity standards to be fulfilled and allow stability requirements to be fulfilled. Just as a general remark, a characteristic for the DOS test, there is no need to have an intrinsic value or merit. You will, for example, see that in a number of protocols, we observe the hairiness of leaves or sheaths or whatsoever, and you can imagine that the value for the market of this characteristic is rather limited. But for a DOS test, this is a useful characteristic. We normally use morphological characteristics. This means we hardly have any uh, biomolecular characteristics in the list of characteristics that uh, is based on UPOF. The UPOF uh, definition of describing varieties is based on the phenotype. Uh, sometimes we use physiological characteristics, resistances. This is very important in vegetables. And uh, to come back to the first um, remark again, uh, yield as such is not a DOS characteristic. Um, I need to go a little bit further into different types of characteristics because they determine at the later stage uh, the types of approaches and assessments for the US. We have uh, our preferred characteristics are qualitative characteristics where the expression is either absent or present. They are thus genetically stable and they do not have a reaction to the environment. Barley, number of rows, either two or six. So it's qualitative. Since it is a nice qualitative characteristic, it is also used for grouping, which means if I have a candidate variety which has a six row barley, I do not need to grow it along with two row barley. Then we have the pseudo qualitative characteristics. There, the range of variation is at least partly continuous, but it varies in more than one direction. I take this uh, picture from UPOV, where you have uh, the middle light rose, uh, uh, reddish rose color, uh, flower color, which can get lighter or darker and then to the yellowish part or whitish part and to the pink part or dark part and yellow is a, clearly a separate note. And then we have quantitative characteristics. These are expressions of linear scale and one dimensional. The most common one used is plant length, which goes from very short to short to medium to long to very long. So this is really a linear scale. Then now that we have seen that there are different types of characteristics, we have also different methods of observations. And you can find all these abbreviations also in the technical protocol. We have visual observation, that means the examiner stands in front of the plot or in the greenhouse in front of the plot and looks at the candidate variety 
looks at the technical protocol at the example varieties and attributes based on his observation a note to this uh, variety for that characteristic. Then we also have measurements that happens more in seeds, uh, seed propagated species where you have uh, variation, where you take single plants and uh, do measure them. You can also attribute one measurement only to a plot. So either you attribute one node to a group of plants after your observation, that is uh, indicated by a G, a group of plants, or you have several nodes or measurements to a single plant. This is then indicated as an S. Now, with these uh, preliminaries, uh, you have, we can enter now into the assessment of uniformity. And the basic regulation states, a variety shall be deemed to be uniform if subject to the variation that may be expected from the particular features of its propagation, it is sufficiently uniform in the expression of those characteristics and included in the examination for distinctness as well as any others used for variety description. That means that the uniformity assessment takes into account the feature of propagation and it is based on the expression of the characteristic. As a consequence, a variety must first fulfill the uniformity requirement before distinctness can be assessed and that is why in this presentation you find uniformity before distinctness. You remember that we talked about taking into account the feature of propagation for self-pollinated varieties like lettuce. The, we have the same genome more or less as the mother plant, so we expect a low level of genetic variation. And we have uh, cross-pollinated varieties such as cabbage or rye grass, where we have uh, by nature as a feature of propagation, high genetic variation and also a higher reaction to the environment. In addition, we have hybrid varieties where again we need to take into account this type of propagation when we assess uh, the uniformity. In other words, what can we expect from a certain type of variety to, uh, to make a fair uniformity assessment? And here, uh, with all these information, the type of expression of characteristic, the method of propagation, the different features of propagation, you can see what is done in the different assessments by the expert. I leave it to you to study this table when you have more time. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to show you some examples, uh, examples for assessing uniformity. Here, uh, uh, let's go to the seed. We are with the seed propagated species and with self pollinated crop, barley. And there we have what we call the off type approach. Since uh, the variety itself is rather uniform by genetics, uh, we can more easily identify a plant uh, which is different than the other plants in the variety, and that is what we call an off-type. And uh, in the technical protocol, you have uh, mentioned for barley the thresholds. So for self-pollinated varieties, and there we come a little bit into statistics, a population standard of, uh, I can't see it really, is, um, where is it? I think it's 1% should be applied with an acceptance probability of at least 95%. And that means in a case of a sample size of 2,000 plants, two, uh, five off types are allowed. And for male sterilines, because there are hybrids in barley now, uh, we say that uh, a population standard of 0.2 is uh, to be applicable. And uh, that means that um, eight off types are allowed in 2,000 plants. For hybrids, you can have difficulties to get a proper pollination. That means uh, we will not blame the hybrid variety itself. Knowing this, for that reason, we allow for a higher number of off types for this type of material. And there we have uh, 27 off types allowed in 200 plants. Now, a seed propagated species, but, but cross pollinated, uh, for example, ryegrass, uh, we apply the relative uniformity. That is a principle in UPOV, which means 
for cross-pollinated uh, varieties, the candidate variety should not be less uniform than the mean uniformity of all already known varieties. That is why it is called relative uniformity. And here I took a, an extract of, I think it was ryegrass, where we say if uniformity is assessed by the combined over years uniformity method, which is called D, you remember that these uh, varieties are tested more than one year, mostly two, some three years, the candidate variety is sufficiently uniform in the respective characteristic if the relative tolerance limit in relation to comparable varieties does not exceed the 1% significance level or less in a test over two years. And this uh, threshold is adapted for a test over three years where it is 0.1% uh, to be applied. Um, if you, I, I forgot to put it in the sentence here, if you want to have more details on this, I would suggest that you look at the UPOF website. There you will find the UPOF collection and there again you have the so-called TGP documents and all these approaches are very good explained in the TGP-8. After uniformity comes stability. Why? Because during the technical examination for seed propagated species, the test takes place uh, over two years minimum, sometimes three years, of seeds coming out of the same first submission of that material. It means it comes out of the same bag. Stability is a question on uh, generations. The approach is that if in a first growing cycle the variety was uniform, and the same seeds uh, from the same seed bag are used for the second growing cycle and the variety is still uniform, we can conclude that uh, the variety is stable. The background uh, is again explained here in the regulation. The important sentence is that the variety remain unchanged after repeated propagation. I took here a slide from UPOF again. Uh, you have the original material, then you have generation one, generation two, generation N, and the variety does not change. This implies, of course, the efforts of the breeders in the maintenance breeding. If there is a change over generations, then the variety would not be stable. Now we come to distinctness. A variety shall be deemed to be distinct if it is clearly distinguishable by reference to the expression of the characteristic from any other variety whose existence is a matter of common knowledge. Or maybe you remember what I mentioned at the very beginning in relation to the reference collection. Varieties of common knowledge are held in reference collections. What makes a variety being a variety of common knowledge? It has been commercialized. It is published with a detailed description, a filing an of an application for plant variety rights or for any other official register like a national listing makes it a variety of common knowledge and there is the existing of living plant material in publicly accessible plant collections. So just to make it clear this is or it's not and. So there are many varieties in common knowledge particularly uh, in so big species. Now, for the assessment of distinctness, there must be a clear difference in at least one characteristic of the protocol. Here we have an example of plant height, and it is, as we remember, a quantitative characteristic, so a linear scale, and there you can say this is maybe not sufficiently, or I think as they say, you have clearly this difference, but that might be sufficiently clear. It must also be consistent. In the first growing cycle you see this difference, so it must also be a repeat the same difference in the same direction in the growing, in the second growing cycle. 
So you understand, uh, have understood so far that the distinctness assessment is based on the growing trial and there are different possibilities. Either it is made on a side-by-side -side visual observer observation, that means the candidate variety and the potentially similar variety, which is of common knowledge, are side-by-side -side or close by, or you have them in a growing trial and the assessment is done by nodes. Side-by-side -side is also done by node, by the way. The assessment is done by nodes by attributing the nodes, or you do it by statistical analysis of the growing trial. The choice of each approach depends on feature of the propagation, the type of expression of characteristic, here as mentioned earlier, and the type of the record. The D assessment based on nodes for qualitative characteristics is rather easy. You remember the six row and the two row barley. It's clearly it, one node is sufficient to establish distinctness. Then we have the PQ characteristics. That was the picture with the rose uh, flower color. There it is put down in the guideline what can be considered as a sufficiently clearly this difference and what uh, which differences are really required. And in certain circumstances, varieties described by the same state of expression may be clearly distinguishable in PQ characteristics. QN characteristics, uh, a difference of two nodes often represents a clear difference, but that is not an absolute standard for assessment of distinctness. Depending on factors such as the testing phase, the year, the environmental variation or range of expression in the variety collection, a clear difference may be more or less than two nodes. So that is not a law, if I may say so. Now, coming to the D assessment based on statistics, this is mostly applied to QN characteristics, and here going to self pollinated and vegetatively propagated. Uh, we often use the least significant difference approach, where we have a threshold established, and this threshold establishes a minimum distance which needs to be achieved in the mean value between a candidate variety and the similar variety so that the candidate variety for a given characteristic can be considered distinct. So it's uh, the LSD method. Uh, I have here again <clears throat> the example barley. If distinctness is assessed using the t-test least significant difference, the difference between two varieties is clear if it occurs with the same sign, so what I mentioned earlier in the same direction, at the 1% significance level or less in two consecutive or two out of three growing cycles. So the minimum distance is calculated and then the measured mean is compared and we check if this distance is given or not. If it is not given, we consider that in that characteristic the candidate variety is not sufficiently different. Self and cross-pollinated varieties. There we do a lot of measurements uh, because in any case we need to do the measurements in order to establish the relative uniformity for the uniformity assessment. And we use also these measurements to de uh, determine the distinctness requirement. That means <clears throat> a minimum distance is calculated, taking into account the environmental impact on the expression of the characteristics during the minimum two growing cycles. And that method is called combined over years distinctness, which is COID. Again, all the details are explained in the UPOF document TGP8. And um, here again for the barley. You can also use it for self and cross pollinated uh, varieties. It is not exclusively uh, limited to cross pollinated varieties. In the barley TP, we have if distinctness is assessed by call D, the difference between two varieties is clear. If the respective characteristics are different at the 1% significance level or less in a test over either two or three years. Uh, this is a very important sentence. Nodes in the variety description are independent from the D assessment, at least there where measurements have taken place. When we do the least significant difference analysis or the COID, where we compare the mean values, 
based on a statistical uh, value we have calculated. The decision on distinctness takes place at that moment. Then the next step for the variety description is attributing nodes to the expression of the variety for that characteristic. So it will get a node in order to be described, but it is not that node which explains when you read the variety description that based on these nodes, the variety is distinct to another variety of which you maybe also have in front the variety description. You cannot read from the variety description uh, which basis was used for the distinctness assessment. For that you would need to go into the technical protocol. This is how a DOS report looks like. I guess many of you have seen them already and uh, you will get across on distinctness, uniformity and stability. If it is positive, it is accompanied by a variety description. The variety description does mention the testing place and the period of testing, the technical protocol used. It describes the variety with the characteristics of the table of the technical protocol. If there is a similar variety which has been identified by the examiner, it is mentioned in chapter 16 and any other additional information which is considered relevant is mentioned in chapter 17. That variety description is sent to the applicant in order to check whether he can agree to it or if he maybe have, has some comments. The purpose of a variety description is to identify the protected variety. That is also essentially the main reason why we need to check uniformity to be able to say this is the variety X. Uh, coming to the end, just uh, to inform you about CPVO variety databases, uh, which you will also find on our website. We have the CPVO application types and force database where you can also see and find for most of uh, the varieties which are protected the variety descriptions and then you find the variety finder that is a database maintained by the CPVO which contains information on registers of more than 60 countries with a general search tool it also include, includes a similarity search tool to test the suitability of denominations that is also uh, very useful for applicants if you want to get more knowledge on really the technical part of the DOS test, I suggest that you look into the UPOF website and you may uh, sign up for a UPOF distance learning course, DL205. Uh, I think that is uh, a rather useful course. Yes, with this, I come to the end of the presentation. And I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you indeed. And it was a very interesting presentation. So um, I suggest to all participants to use the opportunity and ask uh, for questions. And um, to give the example I would like <laughs> to start, I have a small question uh, while the participants are thinking about theirs. Mm, and then we have been talking about uh, so the, the the US test and you were mentioning various sessions that should take place at least two sessions does that mean that the uh, the test is, lasts for a quite a long time then what is the average length of uh, the US test uh, as it depends on the species or is there an average uh, length that we may mention? Well, uh, an average length would maybe not be useful. It does depend on the species and they are depend on uh, which in, in which environment is the species tested. Uh, ornamentals are mostly clones. They are tested in a controlled environment. That means the observations we make uh, once are uh, rather sure to be seen a second time with the same node. So most of ornamentals are tested during one year, which is often one growing cycle. Then uh, most of seed propagated species are often tested two years because they are sown outdoors 
and you can have a very bad year where you're not sure that the expression of the variety was really related to its genotype or more to its phenotype. Uh, when you're not sure, you go for a third year. And then you have these fruit trees like apple, pear, uh, which need at least three, most commonly four and sometimes five years. I see. <laughs> well, that's uh, sometimes can be a long time, yes. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. So we have a couple of questions now uh, that have arrived from the participants. Um, I will just share my screen so we can. Can you see the questions? Uh, yes. Very good. So the first question is when we will receive today's presentation, and uh, I'll do it as soon as possible, as we can cut the as soon as we can cut the video and uh, provide that to you in the form of a streaming view. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you were mentioning under TGP documents on uh, the uh, YouPub website. Is that correct? Yes. I understood that correct. So I will insert them also in the follow-up email. Uh, so that everybody is going to receive them direct, if it's downloadable, uh, everybody is going to receive that directly without having to look for it, which is also a interesting uh, feature of the webinar. So I hope it can help of help. Then we have a question from from Kathleen, who is asking: Is is hemp under other uh, listed under other agricultural speech species, or where is it uh, listed? she is asking yes uh, thanks for this question a uh, very um, uh, intense uh, subject matter at the time being hemp cannabis sativa is other agricultural species pharmaceutical cannabis sativa which is uh, not hemp uh, in our definition is uh, not treated as any other agri as other agricultural species for the purpose of the DOS test for CPVR. Uh, why? Hemp is mostly grown outdoor. It is produced for fiber purposes. This cannabis sativa. Then we have varieties also cannabis sativa, which are pharmaceutical varieties. And these are mostly grown indoor. That means, uh, that is because of the particular fact that they contain uh, psychotropic substances. It must be a secured environment. You need to have an opium exemption permit. Um, getting material of your varieties to the Netherlands where we do carry out our test is requiring an import permit and many other uh, things which need to be done for this type of material. Uh, so to make it short, uh, this test is not like fiber hemp. It is much more cost intensive and that is why we have a particular fee group uh, for pharmaceutical cannabis and that is fee group eight. And it will, because it is tested uh, like ornamentals, in fact. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, we have another question. How do you assess the possibility of establishing DUS tests adapted for organic varieties? A uh, very good question. Thank you for this one. Uh, we are all um, thinking about this together with uh, EcoPB, uh, Feebel, and other players, uh, Borg Institute in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, there is a lot of work going on on the level of the European uh, Commission. There was uh, a temporary experiment for heterogeneous material. There will be a temporary experiment for organic uh, bread varieties, which is in the phase of being set up in order to get knowledge about uh, establishing procedures to do an adapted DOS test for this variety. So for the time being, we are working on it. Uh, if there are breeders around uh, uh, the auditorium, 
uh, they are very much invited to participate to these discussions because we need their input. Um, I think that, uh, well, firstly, I would say that there are already a number of organic varieties, of varieties which are used in organics, but also claimed as organically bred varieties, which do have community plant variety rights. So they do fulfill the conditions. Where it becomes more tricky really is uh, when we have uh, material uh, which is, let's say, standing on broader feet on purpose. Breeders do develop varieties uh, which are able to have a better reaction, a more resilient reaction to the environment, which is often to the detriment of uniformity. So the highest uh, critical point, to my opinion, will be uniformity, and there we need to find something. But uh, if all stakeholders talk to each other, learn from each other, I'm rather convinced that we can make big progress. Um, I think there's a question related to the letter that we have just answered. Um, it's uh, do the characteristics sometimes appear to be not constant under different growing conditions, for instance, organic condition. So we we'll close up the organic questions. Uh, yeah. Issue. Well, um, we aim at finding and using uh, characteristics for the DOS tests, which are rather independent from. Uh, the environment. But sometimes we need to have characteristics which are sensitive to environment. In that case, we try to observe this characteristic several times, at least two subsequent growing cycles. Or we give it a wide range of observations so that when we establish distinctness, we can clearly state the varieties distinct from each other. Let me think about uh, organic conditions. I, I tend to say no, because the characteristics for the DOS test are not generally characteristics used for the so-called value testing of varieties. In organic conditions, there is uh, the use of less entrants, of course, um, which affects uh, the, let's say, compet uh, competition between plants, which affects, uh, of course, uh, let's say, the health status of leaves, that it could be an impact, but I generally would say we try to avoid this type of characteristics, which go more in the value testing or shortly said VC testing. I think that is also something uh, which we will find out when we will have uh, the temporary experiment in place. And there again, uh, we need the input of breeders to share with us their experience. Thank you. Uh, another question um, more regarding uh, the functioning of the system. If a variety is already registered in a certain EU country, is it automatically to be considered under the CPVO umbrella protection as well? No, it is not. Um, you have, um, I, the, the question reads, if a variety is already registered in an EU country. And there we have different types of registers for the important agricultural and vegetable species. We have the national list for commercialization, which is a register which ends up in the common catalog. That means in that catalog, you can find all varieties uh, which are authorized to be commercialized. And this registration also requires the DUS test and you have other national registers, which are uh, for the national protection. But these are all different, let's say, legal entities. So if you have your variety listed, or if you have it protected on a national level, you have two different rights on it, or 
authorizations. But the community plant variety rights is based on a different legislation. Therefore, it is a different procedure for which you need file an application in order to obtain the protection. Uh, so since we are talking about the US test, I will also introduce a question regarding the US test and DNA markers. Do you use DNA markers for the US tests and do you include them to an official description? No, the, uh, for, for we do not uh, use the US test for the official description. Um, UPOF basis is that uh, the variety is presented by its phenotype, by the expression of its phenotype, and uh, that is what uh, brings us to the fact that the variety description is describing the phenotype. However, we do use DNA markers in the DUS test for certain reasons, uh, for certain uh, assessments. We have some markers which are used um, for uh, determining disease resistance genes. So to be able to declare that for a given disease characteristic, a candidate variety has uh, this uh, characteristic absent or present. But uh, most of the time, the DNA markers are used for what we call the management of reference collections. You remember, that uh, varieties of common knowledge which need to be taken into consideration for the distinctness assessment of the candidate variety. Uh, in, uh, we have uh, thousands of varieties in common knowledge and uh, we use DNA markers uh, as a complementary tool for the management of the reference collection. And generally, we based on a number of markers, uh, we get a profile of all the different varieties in common knowledge. Then we make a profile, a genetic profile based on hundreds, uh, sometimes a thousand of markers um, of the candidate variety. And then uh, we run the profile of the candidate variety against each um, profile of varieties of common knowledge. And we have established um, uh, uh, distance, uh, often it is uh, Rogers distance or Jacquard distance, in order to determine the genetic similarity. And there we have a threshold, for example, in potato, we have said if the similarity uh, is, a genetic similarity is higher than 85% uh, between a candidate variety and a variety of common knowledge, that variety of common knowledge needs to go into the growing trial to compare their phenotypes. So yes, we do use and no, we not for the, con for the official description. Thank you. <clears throat> Another technical question. How or where can breeders give their input for the US test testing under organic conditions? Okay, we have uh, um, at the CPVO, we have four uh, crop sector expert meetings. It's agriculture, vegetable, fruit, and ornamentals. Um, mostly concerned are, for the time being, vegetables and agricultural crop expert meetings. We will meet once per year with all examiners from the national uh, uh, examination offices and we always have uh, participants from the breeders associations uh, participating to these meetings and in these meetings for example one uh, important uh, issue is the discussion of technical protocols the breeders representatives today let's uh, remain with the seed sector are uh, the euro seeds uh, and um, eco pb and ECOPB is uh, the association uh, which represents the organic breeders uh, to the office. That is one possibility, and this is certainly the most detailed uh, way to participate uh, to the setup of a technical protocol. So as an organic breeder, I would contact ECOPB. 
if I would wanted to know what's going on and how can I attend. There are two other possibilities and there you maybe also um, go via ECOPB. There are two projects financed by Horizon 2020, or three even, uh, which are uh, very interesting for organic breeders. The first one I'm pretty sure they know, this is Life Seed, uh, really focusing on organic uh, varieties and organic growing and breeding. Then since uh, uh, a few months only, there is a program called Invite, and a second one, Innovar. Uh, CPVO is stakeholder to both projects, and a part of and these projects aim at uh, improving DOS testing, but also the value testing, uh, which you need to, to fulfill if you want to be entitled to commercial, commercialize your variety and agricultural and vegetable uh, seeds. And um, there, a part uh, of this research is uh, dedicated uh, to organic uh, breeding. All right, we still have one question to go. Um, who's, uh, Rudiger is um, thanking for the detailed introduction. And um, this is more of a political question. So you said that CPVO is financed by fees and not by funds from the EU budget. This makes the CPVO dependent on application and PVOP. The example of the EPO shows that much that such such funding produces tendentious decisions. Wouldn't EU budget finding funding be more objective? That is indeed a political decision. At the time, uh, a, a political question, and I, I can only partly reply to it. Uh, at the time, our basic regulation was um, established in '94. Uh, that uh, was a decision taken by um, the, the European Commission, no, not the Commission, uh, the Rat, what is it, the Council, and uh, also, also indeed, um, the EU IPO, the EU Agency uh, of uh, Trademarks, has the same regime. Uh, we are financed by by um, by the fees uh, the applicants pay. Indeed, if there are little applications, we have little money, uh, but then we have maybe also less importance. I still think we need to underline a difference between the CPVO and the European Patent Office. Although it is called European Patent Office, it is not an agency of the European Union. Uh, the EPO's legal basis is a completely different one. And uh, whereas the CPVO legislation is an EU regulation and there, the full power is with the European uh, Council, the European Parliament, uh, and uh, in that context, it, maybe you do not know this, um, the decisive body governing the CPVO is its administrative council and the administrative council is composed by representatives of all member states. So I think um, the comparison with EPO is is uh, not really, really correct. Yes, you are definitely right. Also, the European Patent Office is based on a international treaty, which is the European Patent Convention, and it involves also countries outside the European Union, which is also a relevant difference that, that makes a little bit the, 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 the relationship between the two not really um, not really so meaningful, so to say, <laughs> in one way. Um, but yeah, I think we got an end to the question and we are also pretty much in time. Uh, it was a very interesting session, at least uh, from my side, and I'm looking forward also to hear uh, tomorrow's session. I Just a reminder for the participants today, tomorrow's presentation is going to be uh, regarding the um, vegetative, vegetatively uh, um, propagated, propagated. <laughs> thank you, uh, species. Uh, but um, as I have announced already within uh, the uh, event uh, calendar, the first part of the presentation is uh, going to 
be a reminder of the general discipline within the CPDO. So we're going to hear a couple of information once again uh, regarding the general uh, setting of uh, the office uh, and uh, the, the disciplines and the procedure. And then we're going to enter to the detail just like uh, we did today in the second part. Uh, by thanking myself once again uh, with um, uh, our expert Anna Weitz, uh, um, I would like uh, to thank you all for being here uh, with us uh, today and it's been a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you once again, Anna. Thank you. Thanks all to you and thanks to you for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And with that, I would close the, the uh, webinar for uh, today and I wish you all a very very lovely uh, Wednesday well it's not this is Thursday but <laughs> a lovely Thursday <laughs> goodbye and uh, have you. a nice week and weekend thank you goodbye